Come on, who's excited to be in church today? Is anybody? Man, this is an excitable place. I almost forgot about that. This is really fun. Um, we did miss last week, and I and I was. Uh, it's been a while since I played guitar either, and I was like, man, these people love to be here. This is so much fun. Come on, if you're excited to be in the house of the Lord today, come on, one more time. Can you give God some praise? Amen. Amen. Um, so for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet uh, my wife and I yet, um, my wife Tiffany, who was up here a moment ago, and myself, my name is Elliot, hello. Uh, we have the privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves one time, because we love this place so much, and we miss you. We have a mission here also at the church, and you can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. Amen, everybody. That's a good thing. And I just have a couple of announcements. Before we jump into today's message and uh, finish up this series on worship, um, I got a couple things I want to share with you. Um, the first thing is, is we're going to have pretty soon, starting up uh, really soon, we're going to have a fireworks booth outreach, okay? And that's how I'm thinking about it. That's how I'm talking about it. Some of you are cheering. Some of you worked in it last year, and you're like, huh, <sighs> work. It's work. It's a little bit of work. But you know what? The way that we're, we're looking at it this year is, man, this is our opportunity, man, to be in the community, to really be in the community, not just meet in church, close all the doors, turn off all the lights, have a little kumbaya all by ourselves, man. It's, it's actually, it gets harder and harder as, as you continue to grow and as you can, things begin to change, to think outward. And we, we need to continue to think outward and, and look at this fireworks booth as an opportunity to meet people that we would never have the chance to meet otherwise. Amen? So I'm looking at it, and I hope you will too, church family and everybody watching online, that this is our fireworks booth outreach that's starting up soon. So we have a sign-up in the back. You can uh, talk to one of our wonderfully friendly greeters back there, and they will help you sign up for a shift um, one shift is like a couple hours, something like that, and you can sign up for one, you can sign up for more than one, and we can really work with your schedule on that. And also, uh, uh, while we're doing that fireworks booth, um, I want to tell you, ooh, it's in my pocket, let me get it out of here, here we go. You probably sat on one of these this morning. This is a, like a movie ticket, okay, but it's just an invite card, okay? We're going to be handing these out during the fireworks booth. And this is our series that we do every single year called At The Movies. Raise your hand at me if you've experienced At The Movies before. So much fun. So cool. Very exciting. And we're going to be giving one of these cards out to every single person who visits that booth. But I, I wanted to give one to you so that you could have some of the dates on there. It starts uh, July 9th. July 9th. And if you, like I said, if you haven't experienced this before, uh, I promise you, if, if someone hasn't been to church in a little while, one of your friends, one of your family members, uh, a cousin, a nephew, your auntie, whoever, I don't know why I said auntie, I don't need to say it like that, it's your aunt, okay, like an aunt, it's your aunt, and not even your auntie, it's just your aunt, somebody in your family who hasn't been to church in a little while, um, there's the schedule on here, right here, they're all family friendly, so um, not like your kids are going to enjoy all of them, but nothing that would scare any of them for sure. But especially that inside out one, so much fun, so much fun. But all the dates are on there, and these, these at the movies presentations take modern day parables, aka movies, and we use those to communicate biblical truths. And it's very, very exciting. We're going to have a lot of fun with it. I encourage you to invite invite people, invite your friends, invite your family. This is a great opportunity to take a, a summer month that people are on vacation and they're, they're doing different things. They're, they're running back and forth. They're out of sync, out of their routines, their normal routines, and, and get them back in to church and to experience something in church that they never experienced before. And you got to see it to believe it. If you've never experienced it, you got to see it to believe it. And that's all i got to say about that. Let's take out our, our notes, our message notes, the bulletins that you were handed. Or you can open the YouVersion Bible app and you can follow along with all the notes there. This baptism right here has got me like distance. Like I, I want to reach out and touch the front row, but I can't. It's, it's a little bit awkward for me. And I feel like I'm going to fall into it too. I'm about to get baptized today. No good, no good. But we do have some baptisms today. Who's excited about that? Oh my gosh. So much fun. Now this series we're closing up. Uh, it's a series called Closer because we want to get closer to the Lord in this series. This is about biblical worship. And we all worship something. You know that? Bless you. We all worship something, and it's, it's built into us. It's part of our DNA, and it's a, it, worship is a response to what we value most. 
I would say um, it's really easy to see. You can follow the trail of, of time, follow the trail of money, follow the trail of, you know, all the things that you do to kind of find the things that are most important to you that you tend to worship in life. And it's not bad to have other things in your life. We've talked about this throughout the series. It's, it's that God belongs at the top of our list. And it's not bad to have other things on your list, sports and, and hobbies and your family and, and things that are legitimately very important. But what we don't want is for anything to take the throne that only God could be seated at. Only God could be seated at the throne of our heart. And when we get that in order, and that's what worship is all about, is putting him first. Today is the culmination of the series. Uh, so what are we supposed to do about all this? What are we supposed to do? Is there instructions in the Bible about how we are supposed to worship him? When someone says worship service, hey, let's go to a worship service. Every single one of us has something that flashes in our mind. We have something that, like, pops into our mind. Maybe it's stained glass, maybe it's pews, maybe it's an organ, maybe it's electric guitars. You know, whatever your background is, when someone says, let's go to a worship service, you all, everyone thinks of something. What I want to do today is I want to break down what the Bible says a worship service looks like. Now, it's intentionally vague about how you meet, when you meet, but there are, especially in the book of Psalms, which will be in exclusively pretty much, not exclusively, but for the most part today, Psalms and talking about the word praise and what it means in its various forms, we want to talk about how to worship God's way. How to worship, because I want to worship God's way. I don't want to make up my own way. I don't want to just come in based on how I'm feeling or based on what, how I was raised or whatever my experience taught me. I don't know about you, but I'd like to know what God says about how we ought to worship. I want to worship God's way. And to, and to introduce this, this concept, uh, we want to talk about the Palm Sunday story. The Palm, surprisingly enough, it's not, Easter's not even close, but the Palm Sunday story. And so let me just read it to you, um, and it's going to really break it down for us. On the screens for you, in your notes, Luke 19, verses 37 through 40, goes like this. When he, Jesus, came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, where the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise. Everyone say praise. Praise, praise God in loud, say praise again. In loud voices, <laughs> I just took advantage of it, that's okay. In loud voices, for all the miracles they'd seen, they were excited. And they were praising God in loud, loud voices. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They were fired up, man. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Come on, they praised so hard. They were praising God so hard. They were praising Jesus so hard that the religious people, watch this, the religious people began to get upset and because, you know, the Pharisees of the time, the, the religious leaders, they had a liturgy. There was a way things are supposed to go. And it upset them. I mean, at least in this passage, it upset them that the disciples were praising God and being rambunctious and getting all crazy for Jesus. Who is this Jesus anyway? Why are, we, why are you praising him so loud? Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said this, I tell you, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. And that's, I think that's just Jesus' way of saying, no, I like this. This is good. I'm not going to tell them to stop. In fact, I like the way they're praising me in a loud voice. Do you suppose we have in our minds a way that worship should be that hasn't come from the Bible, but maybe it's come from our tradition? I mean, the Pharisees did. I mean, there are a lot of... You, you, I, you know, I don't mean to be hard on Pharisees back in the day. I mean, religious people. I mean, they... They, 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 a lot of them came to Jesus. A lot of them got saved and, and began to look at him as the Messiah. But the, the hard part about being religious and the hard part about getting closer to God is that we tend to just fall into a, a system. We, we tend to fall into a rut or a routine and a liturgy. And over the years, what had happened is it got to be tradition over the Bible. Tradition over the heart. You know, the, the letter of the law over the spirit of the law. Um, we're going to talk about that. In order to get this straight, we have to learn to worship God's way. And the Psalms is the best place we, we should look. So the Psalms, and I'll, we're going to be in there a lot, was written by at least eight authors, most of which was King David. Um, and the Psalms shows us what biblical worship is supposed to look like. So let's, let's break down what praise really is. So just so you know, a little, little bit of Bible study. I know it's summertime, so you're like, man, can you... Just like, let's just be excited. I'm a, I got to teach you a little bit. Just give me a moment to teach for a second. The Bible was written in three languages, primarily two. Aramaic, barely at all, just in the book of Daniel. But mostly Hebrew, 
and Greek. Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. So in Hebrew, where all the praise, where all the, the Psalms are written, there are many different words for, the, for our English word praise. Because both of those languages, Greek and Hebrew, are so much bigger than the English language. So you could, you could describe one Hebrew word in an entire paragraph. It would take English, an entire paragraph, to describe what this praise word means. So you can tell already that if you just plug in a word, there could be a lot more meaning there. And that's why uh, biblical word studies can be a lot of fun. But you can trust your Bible. Let me put that straight. Like if you're reading it, you're like, oh, well, it doesn't mean at all what it says. No, no, that's not true. That's not true. But it behooves us all to, to, to open our eyes up to the fact that we could get something and go, hey, what is this word broken down in the original language? What does it mean? We're going to do a, a word study today. We're going to do a word study today. It's going to be fun, I hope. I hope you like it. <laughs> We're going to talk about seven ways the, word, the English word praise can be translated and is translated in the Bible. It's actually seven different words in the Psalms translated one word, praise, in English. Seven different words in Hebrew. The first one is this. You ready to start learning some stuff? The first word is this, Hallel. Hallel, translated praise. But Hallel means to rave, to boast, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. Kind of how I was on the guitar. I was like, that's, that's Hallel. Hallel is where we get the word hallelujah. Ever heard that one before? That's like Hebrew. Hallelujah. Yahweh, Yah, Hallel, Yah. Praise God. Hallelujah means to praise God, to be clamorously foolish, to rave, to boast. Anybody ever been to a rave? Don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. Don't. Just, <laughs> oh, man, I just, um, I just outed myself. My testimony's for the end of service, okay, everybody? I'm better now. I'm better. But it means to, like, get crazy a little bit. I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. This word, hallel, hallelujah, means to praise God. And we can find it in Psalm 35, verse 18. Watch this. I will thank you in front of the great assembly. I will hallel you before all the people. Yeah, hallel, like, ah, crazy. Like, hallel is that crazy one to be, like, excited. I will do that in front of everybody. Y'all are like, I picked the wrong church to visit. <laughs> it's going to get crazy. No, 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 no. I'm going to break it all down for you. It's going to be great. God wants your passion. He really does. He doesn't need your liturgy as much as you think he does. And liturgy just means an order of service. What he wants is your heart, your passion. Low-key conservative praise, I would argue, only protects your image and ego. When we're down here, when we're just like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to praise him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm praising him. I'm giving him my worship right here. I'm just right down here. It protects us. Yeah, it protects our image. But the way God says to praise him in the Bible is to get a little wild about it. Have a little excitement. Express yourself. He's looking for hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. That's hallel. That's a Hebrew word. You are so much smarter than you were when you walked in here. Uh, I'm sure some of you knew that. Let's get to one that you'd never heard before. This next one's called yada. Yada. That's when I like, used to play cards and I would slap the last card down. Yada. Only like two people thought that was funny. You've been to jail, I bet. It's all right. I know you. I get it. I get it. Yada means to acknowledge in public. I'm here, acknowledge in public, specifically with a raised hand. That's what the definition means. That's what this word means to say, yes, I'm here. It's like if I explicitly asked all of you right now, how many of you are Christians? How many of you are Christians? Yada. You just yada. You acknowledged in public and said, yeah. so not like the surrender, not like, oh, I give up. No, it's like I'm saying, yes, here I am. I am a Christian. I am acknowledging you. God likes it when you acknowledge him in front of people. There's, there's going to be a theme with all this. God likes it and, and takes honor in the fact that we acknowledge him in front of people when we acknowledge him. It, this word is found, yada, is found in Psalm 138, verse 1. And I'm going to make a note. I, I was supposed to bring it up later, but I'm just going to bring it up now. Notice how early in the chapter a lot of these words are. Notice how early. Just make a little mental note of that. We'll come back to it. Psalm 30, 138, verse 1. I will yada you with all my heart. I will acknowledge you with all my heart. I will acknowledge you, Lord. I will praise you. It's just praise to us. They all mean the same thing, right? No, no, I will acknowledge you. Um, and that's why we do that in the, at the end of service when we ask people to, to just lift their hands, to acknowledge. You know, we do it for surrender, but we also do it to acknowledge him and say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give my life to him. 
because there's an acknowledgement, there's a yada that says, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to raise my hand in front of people. I'm willing to, to, I'm willing to be seen. I'm willing to be known as a follower of Christ. And this is not man's idea. Keep all of this in mind. This is not, some man didn't write this. It was written by a human hand, but God inspired these words. This is what it means to worship him. This is what it means to praise him. It's what he likes. And so this next word, um, Barak, like our former president, Barak. All right, it's on the screen so you can spell it, Barak, to bless by kneeling or bowing. Barak, oh, I, I bless you. So there is some calm ones too. You know, they're right down here. To bless by kneeling or bowing, to, get, to, to lower yourself in humility. You know, you ever seen someone do this in worship? Did you know that they're actually being biblical when people choose to do this? It's okay to do this. And it also comes along with some acknowledgement, like people are going to see you, yes. I know it's very hard for us to be seen doing anything emotional. I get that. I get that. I had to overcome that a lot in just being in ministry, you know, be allowing people to see my vulnerability, to see that I, you know, am, am humble before him. It's, it can be hard. To sum, this, this word means to submit or surrender yourself, to take a low position, both literally, physically, to take a low position. Um, but also emotionally, also emotionally to bow your heart in, in an emotional way. Look how it, how it reads in Psalm 103, verse 1. Barak the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, O my inmost being, Barak his holy name. And if you read on in that passage, it goes on to say things like, God, I bow myself before you. If you just keep, I didn't put it on the screens, but if you keep reading that passage, it's, I bow myself before you because you forgive all my sins. You heal all my disease. You crown me with love and compassion. You satisfy my desires by giving me all good things. That's why I, hum, that's why I barack myself. That's why I come in to your assembly and I, I bow my heart before you. That's why I do that. That's what the, that's what the Bible's saying is that's, he likes that. He likes that. He receives that. He, he re receives that. This is true and proper worship. Are you, are you all learning something yet? This is important because we think this is just what holy people came up with. This is what spiritual people came up with. That's just what emotional people do. No, this is being biblical, to raise your hands, to bow yourself down, to get excited. All of it, all of it. Let's keep going. I don't want to run out of time. Zamar or Zamar. I'm really bad at pronouncing these Hebrew words. You're just going to have to bear with me. I know how to spell them. But this gringo just can't always say him, all right? So just bear with me. Zamar, Zamar, it means making music to God with strings. That's if you, if you translate this word out in all of its fullness and in context with strings. And it doesn't mean to just like by the spa, like acoustic, like Andy McKee, but it, 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 like little acoustic. No, it's like slam them. It's like hit those babies. That's what the word means. That's how it's translated. Zamar means to uh, like get after it. Man, Dave Mustang, you know, like, go for it. Like, let's go. Let's, let's hit those bad boys. Watch what it says in Psalm 92, verse 1. It is good to Zamar the Lord and make music in your name, O Most High. It means, like, let's play. Let's, let's hit those. Let's go. Not just little baby strums. That's what the word means is to really hit those strings, to hit those strings. And if you don't believe it's meant to be energetic, watch this. Uh, psalm 150, which is like a culmination of, the, it's the very last psalm. It's the biggest book in the Bible, 150 chapters. But the last chapter goes like this. It says praise, which that's the hallel. That's the clamorous, the crazy one. Hallel, him with the sounding of the trumpet. Like get crazy with the trumpet. Um, hallel him, get crazy with the harp and the lyre. Have you ever seen someone get crazy with a harp? <laughs> like, I don't know what that looks like, but that's what he said. Hallel him, clamorously foolish, to boast, to rave with a harp <laughs> and a lyre. It's not a lyre, it's a stringed, another stringed instrument. Um, uh, hallel him with, with dancing. Dancing? Oh, I'm out. I'm out. Man, if anybody starts dancing around me, I am out of there. But God likes it, man, when we just open ourselves up to just... Maybe just a little boogie, you know, maybe a little, maybe a little something right here. Maybe just a little something. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Uh, praise him, hallel him with the strings and the pipe. Hallel him with the clash of the cymbals. Hallel him with resounding cymbals. Remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about how the devil, um, it's the, the message called Made for Worship. If you missed it, go back and watch it. It's really good. 
if I don't say so myself, <laughs> um, it's really good about how Satan was created. Lucifer, one of the named angels, was created with the strings and the pipes and, and the symbols and the, the, the fittings and mountings. In the Bible, it describes him as built with the three categories of music. And in this passage right here, Psalm 150, God said to praise him, to hallel him with all three of those things, with strings, with wind, with pipes, with, with all of that. Like, we are made for worship. Lucifer was the one who, who was the worship leader in heaven. I'm not going to re-preach that message again. Go back and check it out. But you and I are made to praise him like. Let me tell you something. Every concert I've ever been to, and I've been to many. I grew up next to the Sacramento Valley Amphitheater um, over in Yuba. I grew up there, and I would just go there. Okay, so I, I wasn't always saved, all right? I would just go there with a pack of cigarettes and trade up until I got in. And I went to a lot of shows, a lot of concerts. Every concert I've ever went to, Sounds more like this than church does. I'm being serious. Every concert, doesn't matter which one, everybody's, yeah, singing, dancing, lifting their hands, yelling. They don't care what anybody says. Why is it that the secular gets all the things that God is the one who, who created all those things? And he asks for it in the Bible. And, and, and it becomes like shameful to do it in church. What happened? What happened to us? Where we became so shy, we became so reserved, we're so protective of our image that we can't even worship God the way he explicitly told us to. But in a concert, man, you wear a, you wear a tank top, flip-flops, and you're like, oh, yeah, all good to go. Everything's, cr I'm just saying, what if, we could, what if we could put praise back where it belongs in the church? What if, what if Lifeline became an exciting place to worship God again? <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, it was God who wanted it and asked for it. I wonder how that happened. Obviously, it's because of the devil. Lucifer was the one who was created for that. And so it's no wonder that music has power and that kind of energy has power. Um, I'm not trying to over-spiritualize it. I'm just saying it's, it's pretty clear that people have no problem worshiping at a, at a sports game, at a football game. They have no problem worshiping there. And no problem worshiping in a concert. But when we get to church, it's like, oh, shh, shh, we need to praise him. Shh, we need to praise him. But, but don't raise your voice, okay? Don't, 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 <laughs> don't let anybody see me that I'm there. I'm just going to leave that for you, okay? Let's go on to the next word, shabak, shabak. Translated praise, it means to address in a loud tone or to shout, Come on, <laughs> I'm just saying, it's over and over again. Like, God has spelled it out. This is kind of what he wants it to look like. It's kind of what he wants it to look like. Loudness, shouting. Here it is in Psalm 63, uh, verses 3 and 4. Because your love is better than life. Oh, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will shabak you. I will praise you as long as I live. I will address you in a loud tone as long as I live. The Lord is good. Jesus is good. He saved my life. And I'm going to praise him with a loud voice as long as I live. Who is willing to go back to where it belongs and give our, our praise, our glory, our honor to him? Whew. Good, I'm good. God wrote this. I didn't write this. I didn't write this. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. God wrote this. This is his idea. Loudness. And I, I just want to point one thing out. You might come in next week, and we're even going to have an acoustic set next week. It's going to be really special. I know you're going to love it. But you're going to come in next week, and you're going to go, all right, I'm going to do everything that Elliot said to do. And it's going to be like a quiet moment. You're going to go like, yeah! <laughs> I still think it's honoring. I still think it's appropriate to go with the flow and to not make it all about you. But our problem is not usually making it all about us. Our problem is usually doing anything at all, <laughs> if I could be so bold as to say so. But what I like to do and how we coach people up is like, you know, when it's a, when it's a, when it's a vibrant moment, it, be vibrant. If, when it's a quiet moment, be, be quiet. You know, if, if people are all cheering, cheer along. You know, so we kind of like to, to do that to honor each other and to not, like, startle each other. It's like a really quiet moment. It's like, holy is your name. Hallelujah! It's like, you don't want to do that to people. I'm, I'm not saying to do that. You can still use your sense, you know, and have respect for people around you. 
But when it's time, it's time. We do plenty of fast songs around here, you know? Let's, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Um, toda. Here's the next one. Toda. To lift your hands in adoration. Toda. That's probably not how you say it. That's okay. Two of the seven words, two of these seven words um, are about hands being lifted up. The first was acknowledgement. This one's the surrender. To say, oh, boop, got, you got me. You got me. And that's, again, for the end of service. To say, I, 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 also, I acknowledge you, but I also give up. I've tried it my own way. I, I know that you are king, and I'm going I'm to make you Lord of my life. Not just my Savior, but my Lord. Not just my get out of hell free card, but the king of my life. Not just the one who died for me, but the one I will live for. That's what surrender is. That's what, that's what this means, toda. Toda. Uh, Psalm 50 Verse 23, he who offers toda, praise, glorifies me. And to him that orders his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. Salvation is tied to this word. This word is tied with, with salvation and surrender. Here's the last one. This one's kind of like my favorite one. <laughs> You'll probably see why. Tehillah. Tehillah. Yeah. What does that sound like to you? Tehillah. What does it sound like to you? It means, you know what it means? Exuberant singing. Exuberant singing. And again, let's just read the scripture that goes along with it. I will extol the Lord at all times. His Tehillah will always be on my lips. Some of you just got your life verse right there. His Tehillah, I'm gonna be like, it produces the same results too, doesn't it? You're like, I'm gonna get my Tehillah on my lips, then I'll be exuberant in praising him. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. That's not a good life verse to have. But his love produces joyful singing. You know, just go for it. It might seem strange to you. But as a parent of a child who loves to sing, I get it. I get it. Um, exuberant singing. I was just listening to Emma uh, yesterday. Emma is my seven-year-old daughter. And she is a, she's a worship leader in process, or not even in process. She's already doing it. She'll be walking around, playing with her dolls. I'm going to try my best to actually do this. And she'll just be making it up as she goes. And she's got like this monotone singing voice too. Your name is great. I love to praise you, Jesus, and he is good. Hallelujah. She's like playing, and she's just like going on and on and on. She's young enough. She's not going to hear this. So I can't, I'm not embarrassing her right now, okay? I'm, I'm giving her a compliment, but it's, it's crazy. But she, she's just exuberantly singing. We didn't tell her to do it. But she's just like taking pieces of every song she's ever heard and kind of just putting them together and making up her own song to the Lord. And but I'm like, what did I do to deserve that? Honey, you are, you are making me proud right now. But it's, I mean, it, here's the thing. She's seven. She doesn't have like, she's not embarrassed. And she's at home, so she's not embarrassed. But what, at what point in our lives do we become embarrassed? You know, because I, I know that many of you... Um, when you got saved, it was a very important day for you. Um, and maybe you haven't had that chance yet. You'll have the chance today to make that commitment. But I just would ask you to remind yourself of the day you got saved and how, how that made you feel. Like, what was your response, especially that beginning season of when you were just like, yeah, all right, let's go for it. I'm all in, you know, I'm all in. Give us one year of your life is what we say. And you're, yeah, I'm in one year. And then like six months, eight months, or two or three years later, it, it gets a little normal, you know? And then we're just like, things change over time. I would encourage us to remind ourselves of the, the joy we once had, our first love, so to speak, to say, do you remember all the good things he saved you from? What he delivered you from, some of you I know got saved because you were like begging him to do something for you. Then he showed up miraculously, proved himself real. And like, at what point are we gonna drift back into, all right, I'll just go through the motions here. I'll just check the boxes. I'm not accusing anybody of doing any of that. We all, in fact, are guilty at times of just going through the motions. But God wants your heart. This is the way to praise him. This is the way to worship him. An interesting note to make is that all the excitable words, I told you, are, they, they end up in the very beginning of these psalms. All the excitable words that are uh, just like, yeah, be crazy, they're in the beginning. Uh, so it's, it's funny that we do all of our fast songs 
in the beginning of the worship service, and we start all of our meetings with wins and encouragement. That's like how we roll. Why do we do that? Is it just tradition? No, we believe it's biblical. To so start things off with praise, to start things off with a celebration, to start things off with just being grateful of how God has, has set us up in our life. I was just uh, sitting with some friends last night out in the driveway just talking, and we were looking around. The, the, you know, it was a nice day outside, and, and all of us were just like, man, we live a good life. We have, we have so much to be grateful for, even when we're just standing around talking to each other. If we would just remember that and then transfer and just turn that praise to God, turn that praise to God. So how, how do we do this? Let's, let's like break this down. Let's get this ap- applicable here. The takeaway, the summary, worship is love expressed. Write that in your notes. If you're taking notes today, I encourage you. Worship is love expressed. So let me put it another way. It's not worship if it's not love. And it's not worship if it's not expressed. You know, I'm just worshiping him in my heart. You know, that a lot of us just be like, oh, yeah, I'm worshiping him. I just turn the K-love on and I'm worshiping him. No, 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 no. Worship is doing something. It's an action word. It's actually, actually singing. It's actually, it's a verb. It's doing something, but it's coming from an overflow in your heart. Bonus thought. When you love someone, you should express that love the way they receive it. The way they like to receive it. You ever heard of that book, The Love Languages? Um, I'm going to go uh, just a different route. In case you haven't read that book, it's just a, a book about how there's five love languages and you're supposed to love your spouse or whoever the way that they receive love. And if you're trying to give love away to someone and it's the way that you like it, but it's not the way they like it, guess what? They're not receiving it as love at all. Let me put it to you another way. Have you ever bought your wife a vacuum cleaner? I sure hope not, unless she asked for it, and we'll get to that. Unless she asked for it, there's no better way to say, I love you based on what it will do for me than to buy your wife a treadmill or a vacuum cleaner or anything like that, because it's like, that I'm loving you. Okay, sure you are. Okay, I'm loving you for what you're about to clean up, for what you're about to, for what, you know, I mean, that's not loving them the way they, unless they ask for it, which is exactly my point. God was clear with what he asked for. You see what I'm saying? Like, he was clear about it. He said, I want a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> or, I want Hillel. I want Zamar. I want Tahila. I'm like, this is what I want. This is my love language. So we now know the way that we can praise him. He told us to. Loud singing, strumming of the strings, uh, strumming the strings hard, lifted hands, exuberance, bowing and submission. I think of Emma. I'm back to Emma again. She does this so well. She's going to be a worship leader. I'm speaking it into existence right now. Just putting that in the universe. <laughs> Is that a thing a Christian could say? I don't know. Did Jesus come in about this? Let's, did Jesus confirm all this? Is this in the New Testament? Yes, it is. I'll show you. A Pharisee came and asked Jesus about the most important commandment, about the most important commandment, um, because there wasn't just 10 commandments. Uh, at this time, there was about 613, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. If you were in, in that era a, and a Jew, you had to follow about 613 without the variations of the way that those play out. It was complicated. It's complicated to love God by fulfilling the word, by fulfilling the, the written word. And, and Jesus said, yeah, there actually is a way to break that down. What's the most important commandment? I'll tell you what the most important one is. And if you're a Jew in that area, you're listening up close because you went from 613 to 1. And you're like, okay, tell me quick because I got to know. And this is what he said in Mark 12, verse 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. In love, when you're in love with God, worshiping him is easy. When you're in love with God, worshiping him is easy. People think following God is, is way too hard. Because there's too much I have to do, right? Like, isn't it, isn't it, have you ever thought of that? Like, it's kind of hard, all these laws and rules, and that's exactly what the people were thinking. And, and Jesus comes in and says, love me. Love, fall in love with me. And, and in other words, if you just back this up, like, if you fall in love with God, following his, his commands are easier because you're in love with him. And it's, it's one leads to the other. And be trying to follow all the laws to like produce love is not easy at all. We, we fall in love with Jesus 
And that helps us to do everything else that he commanded us to do. It's the secret of Christianity. It's not trying to obey the Bible. It's falling in love with the God of the Bible. Then you gladly do all the other things. And this is how Jesus said to do it. Number one, with all your heart and soul. With all your heart and soul. And what's that mean? It means expressing my affection to God. Expressing my affection to God. God doesn't need your clapping, your shouting. He wants you, your affection, your heart. God just says, that's how it looks. That's how it looks. Worship checkup. Dare to ask this question. What do I love the most? What do I love the most? I know there'd be a lot of great answers. If, I, if we sat down at coffee together and I just asked you, you would have great answers. You love your kids. You love your wife. You love your husband. You love you know, good things. You love helping people. You love all that. And, but what am I giving my attention to the absolute most? There's a hundred good things to love, but there's only one God who created all of those things. I hope that sticks with you. There's a hundred good things to love. It's not bad to love your wife. It's not bad to love your husband. It's not bad to love your kids. It's not bad to love your hobby. It's not bad to serve people and love doing it. But there's one God who created all those things that we're supposed to put him first. Who do I love the most? Who's at the top of my list? Number two, all your mind. The mind is the place where you think. So what that means is, is focus my attention on God. Focus my attention on God. Think about him throughout my day. Now, sometimes if I'm out and about, Tiffany will call me, and I'm busy, right? And so I answer the phone. Maybe you've done this. You answer that your spouse calls, your boyfriend, your girlfriend calls, and you're in a meeting or something, and you, and you give them the quick, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm heading in this meeting. What's up? which is code for hurry up and tell me what you got to tell me because I'm busy, right? And that's happened to me countless times where I'm like, hey, we're just heading into this meeting. What's up? And, and Tiffany will say occasionally, oh, nothing. <laughs> oh, nothing. Oh, nothing. I was just thinking about you. I just wanted to talk to you about my day. Now, regardless of how I react in that moment, because sometimes I'm irritable, sometimes I'm not. When I look back on that and when I think about that, that the fact that she's just thinking about me, just wants to call me, just wants to hear my voice, just wants to see what I'm doing that day, that's love. That's love. I wonder if that's what Paul meant when he said pray without ceasing. Like you're heading into a meeting, you're heading in somewhere, and you stop before you head in and go, God, I'm, I'm busy right now, but I just wanted to let you know I'm thinking about you, and I'm so grateful for you, and I just love you. Where are your thoughts at? Are you, are you keeping him on your mind throughout the day? That's worship, man. That is worship. We treated God like that in our mind, keeping him on our mind. Just want you to know I love you. So what do you think about most? This is a worship checkup. What am I thinking about the most? And that's a scary question sometimes. <laughs> because sometimes hobbies dominate our mind, but sometimes ungodly things dominate our mind too. And there's no accountability up there. There ain't nobody up there, right, except you. So it's a very raw, real question. What's dominating my mind? And there's a trick for this. The more you lean into God, the more you're doing your daily devotionals, reading God's word, praying, God will come and be in your mind even more as you do that. It perpetuates. So if you're looking for more of God in your mind, be like, I don't know. Like, sometimes it feels like my mind runs away from me. Seek after him, and he'll seek after you. Seek after him. He'll seek after you. If you're struggling with that, it's, I encourage you, check how much you're reading your Bible. Check how much you're listening to the Bible. Check how much you're actually spending time just praying. You know, even if it's casual, even if it's quick, I, I promise you it'll, it'll change your mindset and that's the way to worship him. Number three, last one, all your strength. He said all your strength, which means what you do. Your strength means what you do, what your actions are, are communicating that you do. Using my abilities for God, that's what that means. It means to use my abilities for God. Everything I do for the glory of God, work, play, sports, music, everything. Let me, let me say something really uncomfortable. <laughs> Tiffany loves lover boy Elliot. Oh, smoochy, 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 huggy, huggy, huggy. Oh, baby, you're so sweet. You're so sweet. You're so sweet. Oh, I just love you. But you know who else she loves? Take out the garbage, Elliot. Mow the lawn, Elliot, because those are my responsibilities. That's what I'm supposed to do. And if I'm getting all kissy, kissy, lovey, lovey, but I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to be doing, there's going to be a disconnect whether I say I love her and I actually love her or not. With all your strength means doing the right, those right things. When you do things for God, it's worship. 
when you're working and you keep God at the center of your heart while you're working in whatever job you have, this worship. That's how you can worship God without ceasing. Watch this. I'm, I'm closing the whole series down with this verse, with this verse, the most important verse about worship I've ever read in my life. Romans 12, 1 goes like this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living, everyone say living, and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will be acceptable. This is truly the way you worship him. Give your bodies to God. That means your being. And living sacrifice means as you live, do the things you do for him. As I'm living, give praise to God with my life, not just my service. That's what worship means. It means giving praise to God with my life, my expression, who I am, everything I do, everything I think, everything I say. Worship is so much more than the 20 minutes that precedes the message on a Sunday. Worship is our life. It's what we do with our whole life, giving praise to God in my life. My wedding, let me just paint the picture. My wedding was a really fun day. It was exciting, man. It was a fun day. We, did, we got married right here in this church. We were broke as a joke, all right? So we got to get married here for free. Amen. <laughs> it was good. You know, it was, it was actually a really great service. I loved it. I loved it. All, all of our friends came. People I hadn't seen in years came out. It, we must have packed this room. I, I don't know if there's a file, fire marshal listening online, so I'm not going to tell you how many people were here. There's a lot. We just invited everybody. We didn't have no food or nothing. <laughs> I'm just saying, we didn't have no money. But it was a great service. We really loved it. It was so special. It was a really special day. But the wedding is not the high point of my relationship with Tiffany. You understand? No. The beautiful part about being married is the marriage, not the ceremony. The relationship has gotten better over time through the ups, through the downs, through getting to know each other, through continuing to serve one another. The service was fun, but, but we, don't, we don't just die to ourselves and give our lives to Jesus in one moment. That's what Romans 12, 1 says, is that we are a living sacrifice. It's one thing to die for someone. It's another thing to live for them. Living for them means I'm gonna, I'm gonna wake up every day and do this. I'm gonna wake up every day and remind myself. Maybe that day is, maybe the ceremony day is the day for you. So all you believers, I want to encourage you, keep this in your, keep this in your heart. That if you have not yet submitted yourself to Jesus, or maybe you've never even heard it talked about this way, that this is an invitation for you, that you can submit yourselves to him and you can just say, hey, Jesus, I've, I've never heard you talked about like this and I'm ready to give my life to you. That would be like the wedding. This is your wedding day. This is the service day. This is the day where you're going to get it. So I would encourage you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Everybody in this whole place, let's bow our head and close our eyes. And if that's you, if you're ready to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord, and say, I'm ready to give my life to him, would you just lift your hand? It's all right. This is a place where you can just open up. Say, amen, I see you, I see you. Amen. Anybody else? This is your moment. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Church, let's all say this together. Say, Father God, I give my life to you. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. Amen.